Good morning. How are you? Welcome. My name is Pastor Steve Henry, and uh, I uh, have not met some of you because I've been gone for a couple months. Uh, so um, I've got a new haircut, so some of you don't recognize me. Uh, so a couple things. I, number one, I, I did not lose a bet. <laughs> did not lose a bet. I'm, I'm not ill. I'm not sick. Um, I, just, I just like it. I, I just thought I would try something new. And the truth is, I, we were looking at... Um, baptism pictures. We did a baptism outside uh, a few months ago, and the pictures really highlighted my bald spot in the back. And so the truth is, I'm just a bit vain. And if you know me well, you know I'm a very, a lot vain. Um, And so when I saw the bald spot, I thought, okay, it's got to go. And so I told my wife, I said, hey, I'm going into the bathroom with the clippers, and I'm going to cut my hair off. Would you like to help? Either way, it's coming off. And uh, so... Together we cut my hair, and then about two weeks later or so, so this happened about two months ago, right, right before, actually right before sabbatical, and um, so a week or two later, I shaved it completely off, so I had no hair at all, and uh, I think I looked amazing. I, I got to tell you, bald is beautiful, right? And uh, I had absolutely no hair at all, and uh, I thought, I, I seriously, I thought I looked like a stud. I mean, I don't know, there's no other way to say it. I just looked good, but my wife disagreed, and how many knows when your wife disagrees, you, get, you let your hair grow a little bit, so she said, you got to have a little bit up top, <laughs> so anyway, um, it's just, it's great to be back, as I said, I've been on sabbatical for a couple months, uh, we, 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 we just had a wonderful time, we traveled a lot, we went to the Grand Canyon, we went to Bass Lake, we had, went to Yosemite, we went to Catalina Island, we went to San Simeon. I say we, I did some of these things without my wife, with other people, but Jolene traveled with me and we had just a great time. And then the last few weeks has been kind of quiet and so I've been kind of chomping at the bit, ready to get back. I've missed you guys, I've missed being here. It's strange being disconnected from friends and family for two months, but it's so sweet to get back. It's really, really good. A lot of good things have happened. Our, our new space is just about done. We're probably going to transition into that new space in about two months, about September 1st. And at that time, we will go to two services, go back to two services, because we'll have the additional space. We'll do 9 and 11 o'clock. And so you're at the 11 o'clock service now, so nothing will change for you. But for everybody else, it'll be 9 and 11. And that'll give us everybody an opportunity to be in church together. Uh, There'll be overlap between the services, so we'll have a chance to fellowship with people at the different services, and it'll just be simpler, easier for the staff, easier for everybody. Three services, it's a big day, and so we're excited to go back to two services for a lot of different reasons. It's um, so that's what's going to be happening. That's part of what's happened while I've been gone. Also, we, uh, we've launched, or we're getting ready to launch a brand new website. It's about 95 to 98% there. This is our, about our fourth new design that we're going with, and we've done it all in-house, and it's our best website uh, to date. It's really, really good. And so Curtis has been working on that. Michael's been working on that. And so that's uh, exciting. Uh, the church has grown since I've been gone in the last couple months. I, I snuck in last Sunday, and after this service, after the 11 o'clock service, I talked with about a dozen new people who've been coming to the church since we left, and so, and then I was at all three services. It's just the church is growing, and so we're so grateful that God is bringing people. Our team did a stellar job while I was gone. I, I heard only good reports about the preaching on Sunday morning, but way beyond that, all of the other ministry that takes place day to day and week in and week out, our team of staff and elders and volunteers just did a stellar job. I'm so thankful, so appreciative. I'm so grateful for what God has done, bringing such amazing leaders to this place. And so I just want to say thanks to everybody. It was just, um, it, was, it made it, it This team makes it easy for me to go away, quite honestly, because I don't have to worry about anything. I'm not stressed or fretting about anything. I just know it's handled. And so it allows me to really get away and rest. And now that I'm back, Pastor Ron D. is gone. So I was gone May and June. Now Ron D. is gone July and August. And and so be praying for him. He's taken a couple months to, to rest as well. And then we'll all be back on in the saddle uh come the fall and September. And so it's it, it's, uh, it's really good. I missed you guys. Missed you guys. It's really, 
really good uh, to be back. I remember, I remember my sabbatical six years ago. I took three months off. So this time was two months. Six years ago, after serving for about seven years, I took three months off, and I, I felt like it was going to last forever. You know, when you say, hey, you're going to have three months off, you feel like, man, this is never going to end. And so what I ended up doing is resting a lot but procrastinated everything on my to-do list. I just thought, well, I'll get to that tomorrow or next week or next month or in a couple months. It didn't, that didn't really matter. And so I procrastinated a whole lot. Has anybody else ever procrastinated ever? <laughs> Let's take a look at the definition of the word procrastination here. Procrastination is the avoidance of doing a task which needs to be accomplished. It is the practice of doing more pleasurable things in place of less pleasurable ones. <laughs> we typically procrastinate important things, the important things in our lives. We procrastinate the dentist, getting our annual checkups at the doctor, et cetera, et cetera. We don't really, we'd rather not do things that are uncomfortable or require something of us. So we procrastinate cutting the lawn. We don't procrastinate watching the big game. So I'm going to be watching the World Golf Championship this afternoon, the final round. We don't procrastinate things like that because we enjoy things like that. So we don't want to cut the lawn, but we definitely want to watch the game. I interviewed a couple of people. One person said, I procrastinate cleaning so that I can do more enjoyable things like reading books. And uh, another person said, I procrastinate things I procrastinate things I don't have a vision for. Isn't that interesting? I procrastinate things I don't have a vision for, or things that I don't see a purpose in. When we have proper vision for projects or academic goals or spiritual or relationship goals, we are actually excited to work toward the fulfillment of that vision. So a lot of over the years we've had a lot of projects here at the church, a lot of things that we've attempted to do and have been able to accomplish because we've had good vision for it. And so like this building behind us, everybody's working really hard because we've got a vision to see that place really used for God's kingdom purposes. And so everybody's working hard and we're putting some money into it and it's really, really good. When we have vision for things, we're able to accomplish wonderful things for the kingdom. Someone else said that they procrastinate things that, they, that don't come naturally to them just doesn't come natural, so it's easy to procrastinate, like dealing with disagreement, conflict, conflict resolution. We all procrastinate things, and we all know that it's not good. Can we agree with that? We all procrastinate things, and we can all agree that it's not good. An observation by Dr. Joseph Ferrari, a PhD, he said this, one of my favorite sayings is, everyone procrastinates, but not everyone is a procrastinator. We all put tasks off, but my research has found that 20% of U.S. men and women are chronic procrastinators. Maybe you are in that boat. They delay at home, work, school, and in relationships. These 20% make procrastination their way of life. So, of course, they procrastinate when filing their income taxes. <laughs> we are a nation of doers, but we are also, like people from other industrialized nations, a people of waiters. We do, but we like to wait. We do, but we procrastinate things. This is a good little meme here. Procrastination? No, I save all of my homework until the last minute because then I'll be older, therefore more wise perfect justification for procrastination. I have no problem with that argument. It's really, really strong. But, you know, it just tells us that we do procrastinate. Next one, I'm very busy. I'm very busy doing things I don't need to do in order to avoid doing anything I'm actually supposed to be doing. And so we can all identify with that. Sometimes we spend too much time with Facebook, surfing the web and doing other things the things that are less important, avoiding the things that are more important. Listen, we didn't grow up hoping to be, to be procrastinators, right? We, we grew up as young people hoping to actually uh, contribute and accomplish and make a real difference in the world. And, but the truth is we all procrastinate. And as we look at our text this morning, we see that Jacob, one of the great patriarchs of the faith, he was a procrastinator. So you're in good company. We're in good company as procrastinators. So we're in Genesis chapter 34 today, continuing our study. I understand that while I was gone, a couple of the guys 
actually preached from Genesis, and then everybody else kind of preached on different passages, but we are going to continue on in Genesis. Uh, We're going to be reading a little bit from Genesis 33, the end of the chapter, and then jumping into chapter 34. You can find that uh, passage in your Bible or on your uh, the, the, the AG Harvest app, the church app. And what we do every week is we, we put within the app, so you click on the Bible part of the app, and then you, it opens up right to the passage of Scripture that we're teaching from. So week in and week out, you can just open it up on your tablet or on your phone and, and turn there. So we see in Genesis 34 that Jacob was a procrastinator, and we see from his experience, from his story, and as we read the Bible, we need to remember that these are true life, real stories about people's walk with God, how they live their lives as followers of God. And so we see from Jacob's life that he was a procrastinator, and procrastination opens the door to peril in his story. That's the title of our message today, Procrastination Opens the Door to Peril, to Trouble. It causes problems for us as followers of God when we put off doing what God has called us to do, like Jacob put off doing what God had called him to do. Jacob put off, he procrastinated God's plans for his life, and he paid the price for his decision. When we put off God's plans, listen, we put off God's best. When we put off his plans, we put off his best. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Like partial obedience is disobedience, delayed obedience, procrastinated obedience is disobedience. God spoke. He spoke very specific direction to Jacob. I find that when God speaks and he asks us to do something, he tends to make it very clear. So if it's not clear what God is asking you to do, ask Him to make it clear. I ask the Lord, God, I just need you to make it bulletproof for me. Help me to not be able to miss it, but make it super, super clear so that I can walk in the plans and purposes that you have for me. Well, God spoke very specific direction to Jacob, and he procrastinated. He disobeyed, and ultimately, he opened the door to peril in his life and in the life of his family. So what did God tell Jacob to do. Take a look at a couple verses. Genesis 31, 3 says this, Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your father and grandfather and to your relatives there, and I will be with you. In Genesis 31, 13, he says, I am the God who appeared to you at Bethel, the place where you anointed the pillar of stone and made your vow to me. Now get ready and leave this country and return to the land of your birth, which is Hebron. So he had been in Padan Aram. Let's take a look at the map here. The very top of the map there, you see Padan Aram. He had traveled there from from his hometown in Hebron, and it was up there that he met his wives and served his his father-in-law, and he was there for a season. But when the season was over, after he had spent years in Padan Aram serving Laban, his father-in-law, God was calling him out of there to return to the, the, the home of his birth and the home of his uh, father and grandfather. God made it clear that it was time to return to the home of, of his father and grandfather. The season was over. Have you ever been in that place where the season has ended and God is transitioning you somewhere else? You probably have. Most of us have been in that place where you feel like, hey, the season's kind of wrapping up here and God's got a different plan for me. This is what's happening with Jacob. God was winding down his season there in Padan Aram, was taking him to a new place. And it's in that season that we have a choice. What am I going to do? Am I going to procrastinate, put off what God has asked me to do, or am I going to step into the supernatural plans that God has for me? Well, we see from his experience that he procrastinated and he paid the price. Warren Wiersbe, um, a guy that I highly um, appreciate, he wrote in his commentary this about this passage of Scripture. He said, God's command was that Jacob return to Bethel. Genesis 31, 13 is referenced there. And then to his home where Isaac still lived, which was Hebron, Genesis 35, 27. Instead, he tarried first at Sukkoth and then near Shechem. At Sukkoth, the pilgrim who was supposed to live in a tent, referenced Hebrews 11, instead of living in a tent, he built a house for himself and sheds for his flocks and herds. When he moved near Shechem, Jacob purchased a piece of property and became a resident alien in the land. He was settling down 
in the land. Let's take a look at a few verses, like I said, in Genesis 33 before we get into Genesis chapter 34. This is in your Bible and on the, t- on the app and, and uh, on your electronic devices. It says this. This is Genesis 33, verses 16 through 20. So Esau turned around and uh, started back to see Er. So this is kind of the background. So remember, remember when J- Jacob is leaving Padan Aram, he's, he's heading back to Hebron, and he's concerned about his encounter with his brother because years later he had deceived his brother Esau, stolen his birthright, and his brother back in the day wanted to kill him, and so that's why he had to leave and get out of, out, of his, out of the way of his brother's wrath. So now he's coming back to his hometown, and he's concerned that his brother's going to want to hurt him, kill him, do something to avenge or take revenge uh, about the situation that had happened years earlier. So Esau turned around and started back, so they had met together. Now they're parting again. So Esau re, uh, turned around and started back to see Er. Uh, that same day, Jacob, on the other hand, traveled on to Sukkoth. Sukkoth is about 20 miles east of Shechem. You saw that. You saw um, Shechem on the map. Sukkoth is about 20 miles east. There he built himself a house and made shelters for his livestock. That is why the place was named Sukkoth, which means shelters. Later, having traveled all the way from Padan Aram, Jacob arrived safely at the town of Shechem in the land of Canaan. There he set up camp outside the town. Jacob bought the plot of land where he camped from the family of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver, and there he built an altar and named it El Eloah Israel. So he was establishing the lordship of God in, in this new place, but we can see from his actions and his decisions that he wasn't living out his conviction. And how often do we do that? We say we believe something, but our actions don't match our convictions or our statement of faith. So often, Um, our actions betray our beliefs. So procrastination opens the door to peril. Number one, procrastination hinders spiritual progress. We see this in Jacob's life. How many know that when God calls us into relationship with him, it's a journey of growth. It's a progress uh, walk with God where we grow in faith, we grow in understanding, we grow in strength and and conviction as followers of God. We grow as followers of God the longer that we work with him. So We should be stronger this year in faith, stronger in faith this year than we were last year. We should have greater confidence in God this year than we did last year, and so on and so forth. We should be growing as followers of God because we're in this growth journey whereby God's growing us up, teaching us, instructing us, and helping us to be more and more like Him and less and less like our old man. So procrastination hinders spiritual progress. It hinders what God has in store for us. Now, Jacob had made a lot of progress. He was almost at Hebron, but he stopped. He had traveled roughly 400 miles, traveled right around 400 miles from Padan Aram down to Shechem, and he was only about 50 miles or so from Hebron, but he, he stopped. He stopped before actually getting to the place that God had called him to. Hebron was his destiny, and Hebron was in sight, but he stopped while so close. I wonder, I wonder what your Hebron is. I wonder what God has called you to and what he's asked you to do. I wonder what journey you're on, and I wonder what journey I'm on where we might get close. We've traveled most of the way, but then just somehow, for some reason, give up. What I appreciate about the story is that most of the journey is behind him. He's already, Jacob and his Entourage, his clan, has already traveled about 400 miles, and he's just on the verge of entering into the place, Hebron, that God has called him to go, and and, and he runs out of steam. Have you ever been there? (laughs) You're you're almost there, but you run out of steam. I I wonder, what is your Hebron? Where has God called you uh, to go? What has he asked you to do? What is God's destination for you, and are you procrastinating the rest of the journey? Are you waiting? You know, the enemy's greatest tool is distraction. One of his greatest tools is distraction, which leads to procrastination, which ultimately leads to disobedience. His plan is to distract us, to make us feel tired and worn out, as if we don't have the capacity to move forward. And there's times and seasons in our lives where we just feel completely without energy, without 
the ability to move forward. And there are times when we just want to give up. But when we allow ourselves to be distracted, uh, we miss the mark and we miss God's best for our lives. So how can we procrastinate less? Because we, we already all know that we procrastinate a little bit in different areas of our life. So how can we procrastinate less and make better progress spiritually? I, what I appreciate about the word is that it is so simplistic. The, the walk that God has called us to is so simplistic. It's complex in some, level, in some ways, but it's at the, at the root and at the heart, very simplistic. And so if we want to procrastinate less and make better progress spiritually, we just simply have to make God our daily focus and our priority. Making God our daily pri- uh, focus and priority simply means that we just Bring him into the middle of our lives. We talk to him. And we just have conversation with him. The Bible calls it praying, praying without ceasing, which means we just are always talking to God. And over the course of my, over the last two months, I, I just made that a priority for myself, for my walk with God. Because you wake up, and honestly, on a sabbatical, you don't have a lot scheduled. Even if you're on vacation, you don't have a lot to do. You just, your, your main purpose is to rest and just relax in the Lord. And, and so I made it my priority to bring God into the middle of it and just ask the Lord every morning, okay, God, here we are again. What do you have in store for the day? What do you have in store for me? And just begin to ask him and just talk with him, just like he's present and here because he is present and he's here. He's invisible, but he's present and he's here. He's taking up residency within us. The Spirit of God is within us. And so we just need to make him our daily focus and priority by just talking with him and then including him in the decision-making that we face day to day. How many know that there are a bunch of decisions that need to be made every day And how many know that we'll make better decisions, the best possible decision, when we invite God into the midst of it, allowing him to speak, allowing him to impart grace and wisdom for our situation? So that's the third part. Ask him for wisdom regarding your daily challenges. So we're just simply talking to him, including him, and asking for wisdom. Throughout the course of our lives, in our relationships, when we're struggling in our marriages, when we're struggling in our places of employment, when we're struggling in school, when we're struggling in our whatever, we just bring God into it. Say, God, I, this is what's going on. I just wanted to talk to you about it, include you, and ask for wisdom. When we do that, we will procrastinate less and make better progress spiritually. We will have a greater clarity about what God is calling us to do and a greater ability to keep to keep going and moving forward, doing what God has called us to accomplish. But if, if we relegate God, if we relegate God to Sunday mornings and maybe even to our, our morning devotions, if we keep God there, kind of locked into a time frame, okay, God, I'm at church from 11 to 12, 30, 1 o'clock, right around there, so you've got me then, and then I'm going to do my morning devotions. In the, you got me from about 20 or 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever, then, but then the rest of my time, I'm just going to be focused on other things. When we relegate God to a time slot in our lives, we, we will miss. We will miss out on God's best for our lives. We will surely be distracted. Why? Because if we relegate God and don't include him in, the enemy's got lots of opportunity to distract us and to hinder us and to keep us moving in the wrong direction. We will for sure lose sight of what he's asked us to do. And the result, the result will be procrastination, which hinders our spiritual progress. So what is your Hebron? What has God asked you to do? What is God challenging you to do? And then how are you doing on the journey? Are you procrastinating or are you really going for it? Are you keeping, keeping your vision clear about that and keeping God in the middle of your life and just moving forward as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's a good question for us to ask today, but also ask on a regular basis. How am I doing, God? What have you called me to? Am I doing what you've called me to do? And just kind of keep that at the center of your relationship with God. Continue to ask God, what am I doing, God? Am I supposed to be doing this? Am I on the right track? Am I doing what you've called me to do? Let's take a look at Genesis 34. So we talk about Dinah, and this is Jacob's, well, it's the only daughter that is mentioned in the scripture that he has. He's got, he's got, 12 sons, the, you know, Jacob's name becomes Israel, and he has 12 sons, and they become the 12 tribes. And he's got this daughter, Dinah. He may have other daughters, but this is the only daughter mentioned in Scripture, and so we're going to hear about her today. One day, Dinah, the daughter of Jacob and Leah, went to visit some of the young women who lived in the area. Where are they living? They're living in Shechem, right? And so they're kind of 
planted in Shechem for a season. And so they're beginning to just kind of assimilate into the community and make friends. And so that's what's happening right now. One day, Dinah, the daughter of Jacob and Leah, went to visit some of the young women who lived in the area. But when the local prince, Shechem, so they're living in Shechem, and the local prince is named Shechem, so the same name there, son of Hamor, the Hivite, saw, he saw Dinah, he seized her and raped her. But then he fell in love with her, and he tried to win her affection with tender words. He said to his father, Hamor, get, get me this young girl. I want to marry her. Number one, procrastination hinders spiritual progress. Number two, number two, procrastination brings unexpected consequence. Unexpected consequences. Jacob's daughter experienced the consequences of her father's disobedience. Sometimes others, people closest to us, experience the consequences of our, 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 our procrastination and our disobedience. I wonder, as I was reading through this, why did Jacob settle in such a wicked place? I mean, Canaan was a wicked place, such that the patriarchs made sure that their descendants, their offspring, didn't marry into uh, the, the people of the Canaanites in Genesis 24, 3, Abraham made, a, made his servants swear an oath that he would not let his son Isaac marry one, quote, one of these local Canaanite women. You see that in Genesis 24, 3. There was something wicked about these people. And Abraham wanted to make sure that his son Isaac didn't marry one of these local Canaanite women. And in Genesis 28, 1, it says, so Isaac called for Jacob, blessed him, and said, you must not marry one of these Canaanite women. So the patriarchs were, were concerned about um, the people of Israel intermarrying with these wicked, heathen people. But something about the community, about the area, uh, drew uh, Jacob in. As he was traveling by, he decided to settle there. Jacob was somehow enamored by Canaan, or, or, or he was just too tired and too worn out to keep going. Have you been there? You're on this journey, and sometimes the journey gets long. Sometimes the journey gets difficult. Sometimes we get frustrated and overwhelmed, and sometimes we just want to plant ourselves right where we are. We tell ourselves, like, I, I don't want to move forward. I'm kind of tired of fighting. I'm tired of putting forth the effort. I'm worn out. I, I would rather just stop. And we just plant ourselves, and we just kind of want to wait it out. I wonder if that's what's going on with Jacob, if he's just tired. I mean, he traveled 400 miles or so with his entourage, with his clan, with his family. It's a lot of work, and he's, he's close, but he's just decided he's kind of done. He's just kind of worn out. You know, God understands when people are tired, and he gives us great wisdom from his word. This is what God tells the people of faith who get tired and weary. And I love this verse in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. It's up on your screen here. It says, so take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. So take a new grip. I don't know about you, but I've been in seasons of my life where I'm just really tired. But it's in those seasons where we've got a decision to make. What are we going to do? We're tired. We're worn out. We feel like we're at the end of our ability, and we just want to stop. We've got a decision to make. The decision is, I'm going to move forward by God's grace, or I'm going to stop. I'm going to plant myself. I was walking with my mom. We were doing the Bob Jones bike trail, and it's about a six-mile loop, and it's all blacktop. And uh, I'm, you know, I, I run, and I ride my bike, and I'm I, I'm in decent shape, but on this walk, coming back, my knees were killing me. <laughs> I'm like, man, mom, I don't know what's going on, but my knees are just completely worn out. I don't know if it was the hard, con or the hard black top and just the kind of the jarring or what it was, but I thought, I got to figure out how to keep going. I can't just stop and set up camp here at the Bob Jones bike trail. I've actually got to get home, right? I got to get to my truck so I can get home. And that's really where we are as followers of God. We've, we've got to make a decision, you know, to, to we're not going to just stop. That's not an option. I can't just stop. I got to keep moving forward by God's grace. I got to, I, I got to somehow strengthen my grip. I got to take a new grip and with my tired hands and strengthen my weak knees and mark out a straight path. <clears throat> Procrastination brings unexpected consequences. And so we experience the consequences of our decisions. And when we're at that crossroads, we've got a decision to make. And what I've found is when we, when we decide 
When we, when we decide we're not giving up in spite of the difficulties, in spite of the, the challenges before us, when we decide we're not going to give up, but when we bring God into the center of it. See, often when we're struggling, we don't want to talk to God because we don't think he understands or we don't think he cares or we don't think he wants to help. We think he's going to be a taskmaster, but when we bring God into it and say, God, I'm just so tired. I don't know how I'm going to move forward. I don't know how I'm going to conquer this. I don't know what I'm going to do. When we bring him in and then begin to invite him in uh, for the solution and begin to ask him for wisdom, he just begins to unveil things to us and, and, and give us grace and strength for the journey. He wants to strengthen us so that we can continue on doing what God has called us to do. Galatians 6, 9 says this, so let's not get tired of doing what is good at just the right time. At just the right time, we will, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Often we, we give up right before the blessing, but we're promised that if we don't give up, we will reap a harvest of blessing. That's promised to us by God through his word that if we will just continue. And so what I mean by continue, he's saying, God, I've got nothing, but I know you've got everything. I am weak, but you are strong. I'm out of resources, but I know that you have plenty. And so I just need you to help me get through. And so one step after the other, we're just inviting God into the middle of the circumstance, in the middle of the challenge, in the middle of the difficulty. And we're just asking, would you just, would you just walk with me? I need your grace. I need your strength. I can't stop. I don't want to stop. I need to move forward. And in, in the, those moments, God just infuses us with something of supernatural power and ability, changing our mind about our, about our circumstances and our situation, and he gives us the desire to keep moving forward. So we don't know why Jacob stopped, but he stopped, and his actions affected his family. If Jacob had made God his daily focus and priority, things would have been different. And this is what I love about the Bible. These are real stories. Giving, giving us instruction about how to live life as followers of God. People who have gone before us have shown us what it means to follow God and shown us what happens when mistakes are made. And listen, when we make our own mistakes, we can look back and say, you know what? Last time I made these mistakes, but in the future, when I'm faced with the same challenge at the same crossroads, I'm going to do things differently. I'm going to invite God in. I'm going to ask for his, his company, and I'm going to get his wisdom for the situation so that I can do the right thing. God's mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. If you need a, a new start, God wants to give that to you. If you're tired of breaking down and quitting before you've reached your destination, God wants to help you and give you strength and grace to continue to move forward. He is completely for you and wants, you to, wants to see you successful doing what he has called you to do. So you just have to keep moving forward. If Jacob, if he would have talked to God and I don't know what happened, but somehow he gave up. But if he would have brought God into the middle of it, God would have given him the grace and the strength to continue on. If, if, if Jacob would have included God in his decision-making, if, if Jacob would have asked God for wisdom regarding his daily challenges, things would have turned out much better for his clan. But because he didn't, because he didn't do those things, his family paid the price. Let's continue in Genesis chapter 34. We're going to take the next about 10 minutes or so to wrap this up soon, Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter Dinah, but since his sons were out in the fields herding his livestock, he said nothing until they returned. Hamor, Shechem's father, came to discuss the matter with Jacob. Meanwhile, Jacob's sons had come in from the field as soon as they heard what had happened. They were shocked and furious that their sister had been raped. Shechem had done a disgraceful thing against Jacob's family, something that should never be done. Hamor tried to speak with Jacob and his sons. My son Shechem is truly in love with your daughter, he said. Please let him marry her. In fact, let's arrange other marriages too. You give us your daughters for our sons and we will give you our daughters for your sons and you may live among us. The land is open to you. Settle here and trade with us and feel free to buy property in this area. Live among us. Be one with us. The enemy is always trying to dupe us causing us to believe that this life is it. So eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But the truth is, our best life is yet to come. Our best life is in the future, in eternity, in heaven, with God. This life we're meant to endure. It's a good life, but we, but we, we endure sickness and 
dif uh, difficulty and disappointment and pain and all kinds of things. Our best life is yet to come, but the enemy wants us to believe this is it. And so immerse yourself in the culture. Immerse yourself in this world because there's nothing after, or at least what's coming is going to be boring and monotonous and just kind of unexciting. So make the best Make your best life now. And that's what's happening here. The people in Canaan are saying, hey, join us, merge with us, marry with us, be one with us. That's a tactic of the enemy to get them distracted from doing what God has called them to do. And I love what Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2. He speaks timeless truth about who we are as followers of God. This is eternally true in the past, present, and the future. It says this, dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners. So if you're a follower of God, who are you? You are a temporary resident and foreigner in this land. This land, this place is not your home. Eternity is where uh, we need to be focused. Eternity will, will keep us focused on doing what God has called us to do in the earth because it's short and when it's all over, we will be with the Lord in heaven. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. Listen, God has always called this people to live differently, differently than those who are in the world as temporary residents and foreigners. He's called us to be in the world, but not of the world. We live here, but we don't live here forever. This is temporary, and we've got to live our lives as though that were true. This is not our home, but the enemy, boy, he's always trying to dupe us, tricking us into thinking that this is our home. Listen, our best life is to come. In Jesus' name, our best life is coming. Let's continue verse 11. Then Shechem himself spoke to Dinah's father and brothers. Please be kind to me and let me marry her, he begged. I will give you whatever you ask, no matter what dowry or gift you demand. I will gladly pay it. See, the enemy just kind of baits the hook. Well, I'll make you wealthy. I'll give you all kinds of stuff. If you just kind of go along with my plan, the, liar, the enemy's a liar. He will bait and dupe as long as he can until we recognize that he's a liar and he offers nothing good. Every good and perfect gift comes to us from God who is in heaven. Every, get, every good thing that we experience in our life comes directly from the hand of God. The enemy only brings destruction and pain and disaster to our lives. No matter what dowry or gift you demand, I will gladly pay it. Just give me the girl as my wife. But since Shechem had defiled their sister, Dinah, Jacob's sons responded deceitfully to Shechem and his father Hamor. They said to him, we couldn't possibly allow this because you're not circumcised. It would be a disgrace for our sister to marry a man like you. But here is a solution. If every man among you will be circumcised like we are, then we will give you our daughters and we'll take your daughters for ourselves. We will live among you and become one people. But if you don't agree to be circumcised, we will take her and be on our way. Hamor and his son Shechem agreed to their proposal. Verse 19, Shechem wasted no time acting on this request, for he wanted Jacob's daughter desperately. Shechem was a highly respected member of his family, and he went with his father Hamor to present this proposal to the leaders at the town gate. These men are our friends, they said. Let's invite them to live here among us and trade freely. Look, the land is large enough to hold them. We can take their daughters as wives and let them be uh, let them marry ours, but they will consider staying here. They but they will consider staying here and becoming one people with us only if all of our men are circumcised just as they are. But if we do this, all their livestock and possessions will eventually be ours. The enemy is a thief. His primary purpose is to steal, to steal, kill. And destroy. So if we make an alliance with the enemy hoping to gain something, we will, left, we will be left empty and broken and desperate. But if we do this, all their livestock and possessions will be eventually ours. Come, let's agree to their terms and let them settle here among us. So all the men in the town council agreed with Hamor and Shechem, and every male in the town was circumcised. But three days later, when their wounds were still sore, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, who were Dinah's full brothers, took their swords and entered the town without opposition. 
Then they slaughtered every male there, including Hamor and his son Shechem. They killed them with their swords, then took Dinah from Shechem's house and returned to their camp. Meanwhile, the rest of Jacob's sons arrived. Finding the men slaughtered, they plundered the town because their sister had been defiled there. They seized all the flocks and herds and donkeys, everything they could lay their hands on both inside the town and outside in the fields. They looted all their wealth and plundered their houses. They also took all their little children and wives and led them away as captives afterward. Afterward, Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have ruined me. You've made me stink among all the people of this land, among all the Canaanites and Perizzites. We are We are so few that they will join forces and crush us. I will be ruined and my entire household will be wiped out. But why? Why should we let them treat our sister like a prostitute? They retorted angrily. And that's where the chapter leaves off. Procrastination opens the door to peril. Procrastination, number one, hinders spiritual progress. Number two, brings unexpected consequences. And number three, leaves you with bitter heartache. Leaves you with bitter heartache in the end. When we procrastinate God's plans, we miss out on God's very best. Boy, God has got us all on a road to Hebron. He's got us all on a road somewhere. So I would just challenge us as a church God, to ask the question, God, what is it that you're leading me to do? What is it that you're asking me to do? I want to go all the way with you, Lord. I don't want to stop part of the way and miss the plans and purposes that you have for me. I want to go all the way, but yet sometimes we get tired and in our tiredness, we need to just call out on God and just ask him to bring grace and strength for us. And so we're going to stand up and and worship and and the worship team is going to come forward and we're going to have an opportunity during this time of worship to respond to the message. And so as the worship team comes forward, we're going to pray and ask the Lord to uh, give us the grace to respond properly. So Lord, as we close... The message part, Lord, we know that you're still speaking a message to us that we will um, be thinking about during worship and and the rest of this week and month, Lord God. So I pray that we would respond properly, Lord, with humility and with excitement and anticipating what you have in store for us, Lord. We want to finish well. We want to finish the race. We want to do what you've called us to do in the power of your might and your strength because you're good, not because we're good, but God, we want to we live fully pleasing before you, Lord Jesus. So Lord, help us not to procrastinate, but to recognize where we are and then just decide if we're moving forward by your grace. So thank you, Lord, for your abilities. God, for the ways that, in which you help us walk out your plans and purposes. In Jesus' name, amen.